Oh, well. Shall we begin? Wow, what's that fun? Holy Toledo! Bullseye! Fire away. You're breaking up, Bob. The season can't end like that! Ugh. Faith Radio. Let's go. Let's go, everybody. Let's go. Good morning. Oh, my God! Hold on to your butts. Yeah! Thank you. in a Monday of play, 9 to noon style, uh, where we are happy to be joined by Minnesota Timberwolves head coach Chris Finch, courtesy of Prize Picks, Daily Fantasy Made Easy, and Second Harvest Heartland, 2harvest.org. Uh, Chris, good morning. It's Paul Allen. How you doing? I'm good, T.A. How about yourself? Pretty good, man. The snow didn't eat you up a little bit, did it? No, no, no. It was actually nice. We hadn't had that much snow all winter, so I was, I was welcoming it. And um, pardon the pun, but you put a chill over the Golden State Warriors yesterday. You you getting the crowd back into it to start the fourth and beating a team and a coach full of rings. I mean, I thought it was fantastic. How'd you feel about the victory? Yeah, I thought it was a great one for us. Um, you know, it was it was certainly not a complete game. We we didn't play well in the beginning. A lot of turnovers in the in the first quarter, um, first half. And then, you know, we missed layups and just missed open shots and we blew assignments on defense and I didn't really like that part of it, but we stuck in the game, give ourselves a chance to kind of turn it around by keeping it close enough. When you're playing the Warriors, you can always fall behind by a big margin when you normally, you know, when you turn it over and you, and you do those things, but we were able to kind of hang in there with enough, um, you know, just kind of grit at times and, 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 and Anthony and uh, Nas kept it close for us in the beginning till we can get other people involved offensively. You know, one of uh, uh, one of the hidden factors for me that, that made this victory over Golden State at Target Center so cool yesterday is, is these Warriors off their Pacers game. Now, you know, Steph and the players were super disappointed with their Friday effort in a home loss to the Pacers. So, I mean, you kind of felt that you were going to get their best, didn't you? And especially out of the gate. Yeah, there was a couple things that, I mean, we knew that we were going to get their best. And uh, that's one thing as I said to, to the guys at halftime. I said, like, that's a desperate team over there. You know, they're playing desperately and they're playing more physical and they're beating us to the ball and they're doing the things that desperate teams do. We got to turn our mindset around and match theirs. Um, they lost on Friday. You know, Houston's been on an eight game win streak and is right on their heels for that final play in spot. Um, and when you think about it, I mean, it's, it's almost an unimaginable to think of a playoffs with, uh, with the, with, without the Warriors in it. Um, and yeah, I do believe that the other day they'll make it, but you know, they're with 10 games to go, they're, they're fighting for their playoff lives. So that adds to the desperation. They very much looked at this as a must win game for them. Um, so we knew we were going to get their best efforts and they just, they were the, they were the more physical, more aggressive, the faster team and everything to, to get the game started. And, um, 
the lesson for me is uh, it was playoff basketball, you know, and that's how the playoffs are going to be. They're going to be physical. They're going to be that kind of, the, you know, handsy and all this, and we got to get used to it. So uh, good learning curve for us, and we were able to rise to the challenge. Likewise for uh, for the approach to Edwards, right? I mean, they, they really, really went to trapping Anthony and getting physical with him. What, what common threads defensively are you seeing uh, taken against Anthony Edwards? I mean, teams are taking the bet that, you know, he, that we don't have enough firepower out there without Cat to uh, score enough points to beat him. And so, therefore, they're making Anthony a passer in all the ways that you can, you know, trapping him in pick and roll, uh, sending multiple guys at him when he's driving. You know, oftentimes there's three guys when he's trying to drive. Um, and all credit to Anthony. Like, he's really um, flipped the switch in terms of creating offense. He had eight assists last night. Uh, you know, he's always been a willing passer, but he's a wired, hardwired scorer. And like those guys sometimes fight themselves when, you know, they want to score, want to score, want to score, but he's realized he's got to do way more than just, just score for us. Um, and a lot of our great shooting at the moment from the three point line is a, is a result of him getting off the ball and creating the right amount of ball movement. So, so moving forward, specifically in the postseason, I, I'd imagine a major, major key to the equation is when that happened, others just have to flourish, right? They do, um, but they will. I mean, we've seen Jaden McDaniel's uh, big uptick in his shot making in the last three, four games. He went through a large, you know, uh, like drought, kind of right after Cat went down. Um, but, of course, his usage goes up, his, sh- his shot opportunities go up, everything goes up, so... He just had to kind of find that rhythm, um, just, which was a different rhythm than he was used to playing in. Was getting good looks. They just weren't going. You got to stay confident. We got to keep making the right plays. We have a lot of talented guys on our team. We got certainly got shot makers. Um, and if we cre- can create good enough shots and the right shots all the time, they'll go in. They just will. It's, it, it's the same. You know, we've talked about this before on, on your show. I know it's a analogy you like, but it's just like playing blackjack. You know, just, you know, creek. Keep creating the the advantages, and then sit there long enough for the cards to turn your way. Alexander Walker, but you know, part part of the ancillary pieces that would need to flourish with, with Anthony getting the attention he gets. I mean the 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 threes at the end of the third and off the turnover to start the fourth. Holy cow! Just massive, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I and, and I thought there was another a three that was really big. There was. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin from the left wing in front of our bench. They had run two at Ant. He gets off of it. J-Mac flashes it. And um, that was kind of right when the, the game was kind of turning turning back in their favor. And, again, just another clear example of Anthony drawing a crowd, making the right play, trusting his teammates, and his teammates rising to the occasion. Uh, turnovers. J- just three. I, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but three for you guys yeah. and, and, and in the second half, and just one in the fourth quarter after giving it to them, I don't know, man, it's, I counted six <laughs> in, in like the middle part of the, uh, by the middle part of the first quarter. Uh, obviously a major factor in the win, but what changed? I mean, what changed was two things. One was our spacing. You know, we had poor spacing. They were really handsy, and we were kind of, you know, you know, we we were we weren't, we were, weren't really cutting to open up space for our teammates to drive. And when we did cut, we cut on top of people. And we got better spacing in the second half. Calmed down a little bit. Uh, figured out a few things that we thought we could could work. Uh, and then, you know, I, the guys just we were just trying to be too cute. You know, spin dribbles in the paint like overhandling in a crowd, uh, just, you know, indecision. These are the types of things that generally lead to turnovers for us anyway. Um, and we just kind of you know, played a cleaner game, a stronger game, and just a simpler game. Well, um, uh, Conley sure has that hesitation game going right now, ma'am. That, uh, that stop and go was super sweet yesterday, and, and he hit three threes. He had four steals. Your, your quarterback is playing fast right now, isn't he? He is. He's really ramping it up. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Mike last year, you know, actually during the playoffs. Um, and he just, you know, as, as a guy who's been in the league 17 years, he's such an amazing pro. He's still playing at a high level. But you can imagine, you know, the run, 
what the what the regular season must feel like for a guy like him at times, right? It's wash, rinse, repeat, you know, every night he gets a little bit numb to it. Um, but, you know, the playoffs and, and playing in the playoffs is what these guys live for. And, you know, he, you can, we need him to, to be more aggressive. We need him to be this version of himself, uh, particularly since Cat's gone down and he's just preparing himself for the playoffs. You can see that. Chris Finch, coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves, off a victory over the Golden State Warriors yesterday in Minneapolis. Thanks to Prize Picks and Second Harvest Heartland to Harvest.org. Now, another ancillary piece, um, absolutely in need of flourishing, uh, specifically in the playoffs, would be Monte Morris. Now, what yeah. w- was that? Was that his best game for you yesterday? I mean, the the fourth quarter three was massive, but I loved when he was when he was uh, wing right or so to speak. And he sucked those Warriors to him. And instead of forcing something, he kicked it left to Anthony, who was wide open for a three. Yeah. I think it was his best game for us. You know, his his defense has been really good. It's been better than I thought before we got him. I knew he was a, a you know, a tough, tough player. Um, but his positional defense, his willingness to fight and get into the ball um, has been outstanding. And that's, you know, been Really, really important for us because it fits into our team personality well. Uh, the shot making, you know, I felt before he got hurt in the Indiana game that he was really going to like break out and he was starting to get his rhythm, get his sea legs under him. And, you know, then he got hurt again. But, um, you know, he missed the first half of the season with the, with the, with an injury in Detroit. So he's still trying to play himself into like that peak mid-season shape, and he's. In, I feel he's almost there. When he is there, he's, we're going to see the shot making go up. And last night, I think, is the beginning of that run. He, um, I mean, it's uh, you got the Pistons Wednesday. So, I mean, Monte's got to get about five extra minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, we might start him. <laughs> um, now, the last Alan Horton highlight we heard before welcoming you in, Chris, was uh, Clay yeah. Thompson's three-point miss that led to an Edwards foul. Now, Kyle yeah. Anderson's defense on Clay on the inbound flare near the end. You you, yeah. you you chatted with him right before the play. So did did you sniff out what they were going to do off film study? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our our coaching staff does an incredible job of preparing for these opponents, and uh, they, the, the the Warriors have you know won a couple games on that play. They have a few things they like to go to down the stretch. Um, you know, they had run a few of them already. So that gave us a good indication of what we thought might be coming. Um, and, you know, Micah Nori was really the lead voice on that, mm. kind of sniffed it out, told the guys, um, you know, what to, what to expect. They ran a slightly different version of it, um, but it ended up being sim- the same thing. And, you know, that's the best that you can do. I mean, we, you know, we, we try to prepare and, uh, you know, when we, we're so familiar with Golden State, I haven't played them, and, um, you know, over the years, they just have some things that they do so well uh, that have just become part of who they are, which, you know, is the sign of every great team, and they just dare you to stop it. And, um, you know, fortunately for that one, we were able to get enough of a contest out there to, to make a miss, and then Anthony got the rebound. Friday, you beat Cleveland and uh, uh, JB's team full of a bunch of tough customers. They got Evan Mobley back yeah. yesterday. Didn't have him on Friday, but big deal. I- elite work Friday night versus Darius Garland, man. I mean, he can be such a tough customer. Can can, can one employ the same strategy versus, say, Steph Curry, perhaps leading him to shoot from spots he does not prefer, or is Steph just too elite? I mean, it's, it's a lot harder with Steph because he, you know, he is very comfortable at all ranges. Like he's probably a little more comfortable getting to the basket and finishing. In fact, he's very good at finishing when you force him inside the three point line. But with Steph, it's literally just, you know, try to, you know, battle him every possession, try to take away the the open catch and shoot. Um, you know that he's that they they do an incredible job of creating for him. I, I mean, it was. To me, it was, you know, probably uh, Jaden McDaniel, one of Jaden McDaniel's best two game sets. Mm. You know, the way he guarded both those guys, uh, just never gave up, stayed composed, didn't get in foul trouble. You know, just kept battling through screens, through actions. You know, at the end of shots, he contested. 
Um, and he ended up, you know, shooting extremely well on both ends of the floor. So, you, um, um uh, Chris, you praised Rudy's offensive patience post game. What, yeah. uh, what, what yeah. traits is he displaying to lead to said accolades? Well, I think a lot of it is just, uh, you know, kind of picking his moments to present himself in the paint. Uh, that's one, you know, uh, you know, early on uh, when we got him, uh, we decided we're not going to put any, any handcuffs on Rudy. We're going to let him play. And we're going to treat him like a fully functioning offensive player. Um, it just took a little while for us to figure out how to, you know, be comfortable throwing lobs, how and where he liked the ball. And that's just the kind of a normal growth curve. We've talked about that before, but he was also not patient enough to allow his teammates to kind of find him. He was always trying to duck in, clogging up the paint at times, taking away opportunities for us to create drive and kick or drive and finish. So he's a lot more patient now, picks his spot. That's one. Two, when he gets the ball, way more patient and composed. He on balance. He's, he's uh, making the right play most of the times. If, it, if, he's, if he's swarmed in there, he's kicking it out. Um, you know, we're trusting him when we throw the ball to him in the pocket and pick and roll uh, at a high, way higher rate than we did last year. Teams have dared, dared us to do that, and we've just leaned into it. And that's what I believe you got to do. you got to trust your teammates when – they're betting that you're not going to do something. Let's take the bet and and uh, or let's not take the bet and let's just do it. And he's been he's been paying dividends and he just is finishing down there, collect, go up, dunk it. Um, you know, you can just see him playing with a ton of confidence and patience and poise. Well, may, maybe the next metaphorical bet you have to face, Chris, is is like yeah. Rudy on the block and a post play because you you, <laughs> you you don't call many post plays, do you? We do from time to time for him. You know, uh, particularly if we feel like he he has a mismatch on a switch or a deep steal catch or something like this, um, we will throw it in there. And we will definitely try to keep the defense honest. Um, we use it a little bit more situationally just as a, hey, we know we can get this, so let's go to it every once in a while instead of as a full-time thing. I don't think that's like, you know, uh, you know, I don't think if we did it all the time, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay a dividend that we'd like. But mm-hmm. the bottom line is we know it's there, and when we want to, we can go to it. And I always like having those types of plays up my sleeve. A couple more for Chris Finch, coach of the Timberwolves, uh, courtesy of Prize Picks and Second Harvest Heartland, and maybe that leads to playing faster in transition, right? I mean, because like this time last year, you know, we talk about you guys getting back on defense, and you got some bigger players. Carl was playing then yeah. a little slower to get back. Uh, it it's faster this year, isn't it? Yeah, we're better. I mean, all credit to the guys. We just, you know, we just, we determined in the beginning of the season, like, there are a few things that we absolutely have to do better. And if we want to be a better team, and one of them was getting back in transition. We just had to build better habits, make the effort, the give a, the give a crap factor had to go up. Mm. Um, and it just, it just, and it did, you know, it just did. And, um, you know, Oh, there's a lot of people in the NBA when I first got into the NBA, and even today will say, oh, you can't be good on the offensive glass and get back with the pace of the game is so high now. I firmly disagree with that. I think you have to be good on the offensive glass to be better in transition because you've got to keep people hemmed in so they can't get out and mm-hmm. run. Um, and you, you know, Otherwise, you're just giving them a free start all the time. And when you're already a little bit slower like we are, I think you got to be better on the glass just because, you know, that's one way to slow them down. Um, if Rudy goes to the glass, they usually put two guys on him. That's, that, that means you, you should naturally have a four on three advantage everywhere else. And if we send another guy to the glass, then that's another guy I have to take care of. So by committing to the offensive glass, even though we might not get a ton of offensive rebounds, but we go and force them to box out and keep us off the glass, then they, they can't get out and run. So, it's all related, like most things in basketball, but we're making the efforts on both ends, which is the most important thing. All right, lastly, my man, um, and and no yeah. no breakdowns down the stretch, uh, you know, and and I know I know you preach that probably more privately than publicly, but a good step approaching the postseason, in my opinion, and is is seeing it for them and knowing how to hold leads or close late. 
uh, an important part of the equation as opposed to like just being told how to play all the time? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, last night was a good example, like, uh, you know, closing a game now against a really good team that has a ton of experience on how to win those types of games. Um, and even, even with that being said, I thought there was a bunch of small plays we could have made in the fourth quarter to keep it at a six, seven, eight point differential rather than uh, a one possession game down the stretch. But guys, you know, did a good job of executing for the most part. But one of my mantras is big games are won by little plays and, those are box outs and 50, 50 balls and, and just little things like that, that you got to kind of come up with in the moment. And, um, you know, they beat us to a few of those. And that's been a little bit of a, a, uh, a trend at times, you know, in January, we, we lost a lot of those, uh, those leads that we had in the fourth quarter and the game came down to those types of one, two possession games. And we were, give, we were fouling undisciplined and we were giving up late offensive rebounds and, it's certainly something we got to get a hold of. All right, man. Congratulations on the victory. And uh, now you got the Pistons uh, here Wednesday at Denver Friday, back home Sunday for the Bulls in deep, deep stretch before the postseason. Best of luck the rest of the week, and thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks, PA. See you, care. Mike. Yep. Chris Finch, coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves, victorious over baby Steph and his Warriors yesterday at Target Center. Part of the Timber Tech What's on Deck set list, which includes Bob Motzko, coach of the Golden Gophers hockey team. Uh, they begin their NCAA tournament Thursday. That's 1047. Preceded by Minnesota Vikings president and uh, co-owner Mark Wilf from Orlando, Florida, and the owners' meetings. I'm Paul Allen. Nordo produces. This is 9 to Noon. to nine to noon vikes bites is always presented by thousand hills lifetime grazed grass-fed beef and it's a clearwater minnesota-based company they've expanded greatly beyond that since then of course but still working living and thriving local with elite products you can go to thousand hills lifetime grazed.com you can shop online learn about regenerative agriculture and more uh, check out thousand hills and uh, we're going to start here, PA. I, I got uh, a little bit of a house cleaning bit with the Vikings that I saw over the weekend. Yep. And then there's some odds. There's some mock madness. Everyone wants to trade away all of the Vikings' future draft equity to move up into the top three. And I got some things to talk to you about it. I'm going to start with Harrison Smith, however. The Harrison Smith deal, I don't know if you saw this, PA. It's actually for the next two seasons. Yeah. So he takes that pay cut, and re-ups, and wants to retire in purple, or at least we want him to retire in purple. I think he does, too. But instead of just next year, it's the next two seasons. So his $7 million signing bonus is split over the next two years. He's got salaries of one and a half and 1.2. So two more years, potentially, of Hitman being back in the mix. And uh, as the clouds start to clear up and we get kind of a sign of moving forward, how much cash we have to spend, Vikings appear to be somewhere around the neighborhood of $18 million under the cap. So there's cap flexibility still. We got veterans signed to uh, what I would say team-friendly deals, and things are looking nice financially right now for the Vikings. The the with the Harrison Smith deal, um, uh, and and I saw this in the Star Tribune Ben Gessling story. The the two year piece um, it, it makes it it makes it cap friendly for the Vikings now, but it also makes it decision friendly for Harrison Smith if he opts to play in 2025. Yep. So therefore, he can finish the season, go on and get some time to chill for a little bit, decide what you want to do, and and a restructure will not take place or, or, or thereabouts into the next season. Well, think about that too, where the last two years in a row, PA, he's had cap numbers of 20 and 19 million. Mm -hmm. So it forces that decision. I'm glad you brought that up because now mm -hmm. we don't have to go back to the well a third time. Even if he wants to be here, even if ultimately he's amenable to the terms of deals and such like that, it's like, 
do I really got to be asked about this for a month and I got to be hmm. forced into thinking about it? And then we actually got to get agent together with GM and see what the pay cut looks like and play this game for a week. Uh, so you're right. I think the freedom from that and not making this now another conversation a year from now is pretty nice. Vikes Bites. Saw this from The Athletic. I love mock madness. It's all we're going to do probably for the next uh, four and a half or so weeks. Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, move up to three, move up to four, and I got some bits for you here. So, FanDuel odds on the team to draft J.J. McCarthy, PA. The Vikings are favorites, minus 115. Giants next at plus 350. But the... the fourth overall picks and the third overall picks. It switches a little bit. So via FanDuel Sportsbook, Drake May, the favored to be drafted with the third overall pick, minus 150, mm. followed by Jaden Daniels at plus 210. Mm. J.J. McCarthy comes in at 7-1. to one. Uh, The key to all of that, of course, is who does Washington fancy? And whoever they take feels like Jaden J- Daniels, based on the conversations that we've been having, feels like that. You just assume it until draft night happens and a wrench is thrown in the spokes. Yep. But Drake May, the favorite at three, now get to the fourth overall pick. Marvin Harrison Jr. Can't predict trades, so as of now, Marvin Harrison Jr., everybody just feels that that's the obvious selection at four for the Arizona Cardinals at minus 165. Mm. But then it's J.J. McCarthy at plus 240, which, again, brings me to mock madness. The people that are going to draft J.J. McCarthy, that would be a team like the Vikings moving up to four. Probably not the Cardinals taking J.J. McCarthy. This from The Athletic, a projected trade. Hmm. The Vikings get pick four, and then a couple of day three bits, fifth and sixth round type picks from the Cardinals. So they they move up to number four, and they get a couple of late rounders in exchange for 11, 23, 108, and a 2025 first rounder and with that they select jj mccarthy so over the weekend we were texting and kind of you know whether it's the kfan text line at 64686 or it's the talkback machine we love talkbacks hit the free uh the free ir radio app hit that microphone give us up to your best 30 seconds i want to throw kind of this idea into the mix is if the vikings have identified their guy pa are you cool with the whatever it takes mindset to go up and get them? Because right now is is between this very moment, really the last week or so, since they acquired that second first round pick, between that time and draft night, we really are going to go back and forth, it feels like. Private workout last week with JJ McCarthy. Pro day for Drake May on Thursday. And who do you like? What's your flavor? And people will bounce back and forth on that between now and the draft. Yep. Similar to, is Daniil going to come back? Will they be able to re-sign Kirk? We sat there and waited for dominoes to start to fall. Now we got to wait until Thursday in late April. So, if they have identified their guy, do you believe, do the listeners believe that it's okay to take whatever it takes to move up and get that guy. Because from pick four, yeah. and I also have some notes from Jordan Reed, Kevin Seifert, mm. another ESP, Dan Graziano, that I want to get to momentarily as well. Depending upon that scenario, when does the cost become, become too heavy for your palate as it pertains to getting that quarterback? Great question. Great question. Uh, because the, the, the unpacking it from the baseline... Would, would start for me like this. You have a need, and it's a desperate need. Okay, so therefore, desperate times lead to desperate measures. Yep. But to what extent? And that's the that's the essence of your question. So there is a need, and some would say it's a need of desperation. Secondly, Gerard Mayo, coach of the uh, New England Patriots, was quoted over the weekend Uh, regarding North Carolina quarterback Drake May. Quote, he had a fantastic interview at the Combine. He brings a lot of energy. You can tell he has leadership ability. And also the exciting part about a guy like Drake May is the ceiling. Like there's really no ceiling with a guy like that. All right, now that's not an over-the-top take or tell that he's going to take Drake May or take a quarterback third. Uh, Most recently, Mayo, in fact, I think yesterday or Saturday, was quoted as saying, 
the A top paraphrasing, our A topic is quarterback, but the three is open for business. All right, so not a ton to learn there. Next layer. The the I'm not you know it's it's I pushed back in 2020 and last year with the receivers and the tight ends. I'm not pushing back this year. I'm I'm just in lemming like fashion, believing the people with whom I chat. They're generally all, always right about things like this, including the anti bike being in love with J.J. McCarthy. That's going to bear its fruit if he has the opportunity. So I'm not pushing back on this. It's 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 the quarterback draft is deep, perhaps in unprecedented fashion. There are three, four, or five who absolutely will get second contracts as starters in the NFL and good starters. And but they're but of the top three, it doesn't mean all three are going to go bang, bang, bang and be lights out unbelievable. So now you, you balance that with what you have 11 23 and next year's first round pick. I mean, it's going to take that, it's going to take that for four, three, two, or one, maybe five, four, three, two, or one. Forget one, five, four, three, or two. All right, so if, if that's the price of the metaphorical poker. I believe, because the right people tell me, that the ones about whom we're chatting are instant, are are maybe not instant game changers, but players that you want in your stable for, for, for the balance of time that they play in the National Football League. And you have the assets to play in said poker game with that need. And my piece of discernment leading me to believe these people are right and, and, Two, three, or four of them may be unbelievable, including Drake May. So then, yes, it, 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 it's not whatever it takes, like 11, 23, 20, 25 first, 20, 26 first. Nine, no, nobody's doing that, but you're foolish even if you ask for that. So then you put all that together and you consider who around you may be trying to do the same thing and what do they have. Yep. It's fascinating. It really is. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And so I, I floated this by it last week, and it, it got me thinking, really, how far do the Vikings need to trade up? If J.J. McCarthy is their guy, how far do they need to trade up? And, and you've been looking at this, too. I, I know, you know, from looking at the Falcons. So Falcons got a bunch of day one and day two capital. Yeah. I also don't see them moving up a handful of spots to take a QB, given the Kirk Cousins situation and where they're at needs-wise, maybe to support the guy they're giving $100 million to. So forget about him. Bears, well, they got pick nine, and then they got a pick in the third round. Probably also not trading up, I would say. But the Jets at 10. They got a late third. Broncos at 12. Late third. Bra- Raiders at 13. They got pick 13. Mid second, and then around, and then a pick in the third. Saints at fourteen. Mm. They got a second rounder, pick forty five. So the Vikings still have the capital advantage. And so, how far do you need to trade up? Now, I've already gotten text messages on this year six four six eight six. Wait, the the Vikings have the capital advantage. I believe they do. Yes, you know, I like how you laid that out because you know we we were we were with Quasi Adolfo Menso a week ago. Which was, you know, like 72 hours after the trade with Houston took place to get that 23. Yeah. And it's just a feeling being with Quasi and and the stern nature or the direct nature, sometimes terse nature, certainly poignant uh, with the way he was speaking. You know, it, it indicates to me now that you hit it like that, like the currency factor is, okay, from afar, it's easy to say, well, yeah, that's important what you have to give to somebody else. But when he acted on it is key. I mean, he, he acted on it relatively soon after the combine, right after losing Cousins. And in essence, like I said, the, the metaphorical handshake here, man, the proverbial handshake, the verbal handshake, where it just feels like whether it's Arizona or it's the L.A. Chargers, that there's a verbal handshake that with this, this, oh yeah, and that big thing next year, and whatever else going back and forth, we can get there. Yep. That that's what it's going to take for us to get there. And then you look at the currency battle. That then you look at the the money arms race. And Quasi has has positioned himself 
market in a markedly better position than the others potentially trying to do the same thing. Exactly. And so that's gotten to me thinking, how far do the Vikings need to trade up and do you play that game, yeah. PA? Because yeah. they're, they're, in, in the end, it's, we're pushing this up because yeah. it is quarterback heavy on the top end. Yeah. We're pushing it up because we feel helpless at pick 11. And we feel helpless because, damn it, the GM put us in this spot because we didn't re-sign Kirk, and now we absolutely have to get a guy. Yeah. So, therefore, there's no chance we could get him at 11. We we absolutely must hop, skip, and jump, and leapfrog mm-hmm. five or six teams to get into that spot. So, yeah. owners' meetings this week, and it's cool. We're going to get to have Mark Wilf on a little bit later. That's going to be awesome. But uh, Kevin Seifer was sitting with, uh, with Broncos coach Sean Payton, and he said this. This was a tweet. Spent this morning sitting with Broncos coach Sean Payton, whose team, like the Vikings, are in the QB market. Payton said he thinks it's realistic. The Broncos could trade up from 12, even into the top three, and said they've held a private workout with J.J. McCarthy. So as we get closer to the draft and we start to sift through the steam, the Vikings absolutely have the capital advantage, and the Arizona Cardinals know that. The Los Angeles Chargers know that. The Patriots certainly know that. Every team knows that. So in any situation where the Broncos are going to try and make that jump to four, Mm -hmm. whoever the GM is of the Cardinals, whoever the GM is of the Chargers, have Kwesi in their back pocket. You know what I mean? But how do you play that game? How sensitive of a game can you play it? How, you know, because you're, you're, you're risking a lot in some respects to say, you know what? I think we can get to seven. We don't have to give up next year's number one to get to seven, and we can still get J.J. McCarthy. You're dead. Well, and that's what that's what it feels like in this moment. But if that's the guy now, like if if I were to get, you know, Kevin O'Connell's going to be on the radio show tomorrow. So if and or when we talk about these guys, it's you know like like if I could get thirty seconds of vain opening honesty off the microphone from Quasi or KOC. I would really want to know, what's the difference in your estimation? And by the way, with all due respect, their estimation doesn't mean it's right. But for the purpose of the conversation, because here we are in this market on this station and the team plays here, the, the, the separation, the line of delineation, your opinion between May and McCarthy, May to McCarthy, or McCarthy to May, but I'll say May to McCarthy, and then those two to Knicks and Penix. You know, I'd, I'd really like to know how much of a drop-off, if any, is there and why. Mm. Because the 23 with the flexibility, the buzzword, it, it's... I'll go back to what I said at the, be, you know, at the beginning when he laid it out. Desperate times lead to desperate measures. There's nobody more desperate than Sean Payton. There's nobody more desperate than him. And likewise for the general manager, George Payton. I mean, they 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 jettisoned or they opted against Kevin O'Connell and a handful of others and splashed with Nathaniel Hackett. It was an embarrassment. They splashed with that Russell Wilson deal. It was an embarrassment. They splashed with the Sean Payton trade in the early stages. It's an embarrassment. So why wouldn't they, to Monty Asenfort uh, of Southwest Minnesota's finest, why, why you know, that's the general manager of the Cardinals. Well, why wouldn't he just say, go ahead, what do you want? Look at all of our picks the next four years. Have anyone you want. But let's be re- realistic here. So if you're calling for four and you go 11-23 and, 20, and 2025 first, the anti-bike, because of the desperate nature of the fact that he knows he and they continue to fail, I, I'm just, if one of those guys is, is is whom you want, that he will just keep giving and giving and giving and giving and giving until he gets what he wants. Well, that's why it was brilliant to get the 23. Because now you have the 23 and next year's first to get up to whatever spot for whomever is next. And that's when you lay on, at least I do, I'm not pushing back this year. I believe... The, the right people in the NFL telling me that this is an unbelievably deep quarterbacks draft. And and Knicks, there will be room for Knicks and Penix. There will be room. You know, it depends on the scheme, the quarterback, or excuse me, the uh, the skill set, the uh, skill players, offensive line, whole thing. But that's why the 23 here is freaking vital. 
Because if somebody like a desperate Sean Payton just opens up, just basically, here's the ATM card, go take what you want. And, and I'm not kidding you, he might do that. Because, again, they're just so desperate there. And, and they need the same thing we need. That you got 23 where Nick Sandor panics and um, who knows what it would take. But uh, that's how I look at it. We can beat them all to the punch. That 23 in some ways does become a trump card. Yes. If you will. And I love that. Uh, I got some more for you on this and, and some text messages as well. Uh, let's pause and maybe flip this over to the other side of things. Minnesota Vikings um, owner and uh, team president Mark Wilf joins us. About 18 minutes from now, from the owners' meetings in Orlando. But, uh, yeah, some more Vikes Bites and uh, texts and or talkbacks around the corner. Happy Monday. It's KFAN. Hey, PA. Hey, Nardo. This is Mark here in Bloomington. It seems like a lot to trade to get up for a quarterback, but does this regime really care about future number one draft picks if they might not be here, if they don't hit on the right guy? It might stink as fans to think to give up that much, but just curious about that. Thanks. Uh, that's um, that's an interesting talk back because, uh, A, it, it would be foolish um, and or ridiculous for us to speculate on the mindset of Quasi Adolfo Mensa and repre- uh, representing the personnel staff in that, in that, like, bleep it. You know, I, I don't care what I or we give up uh, because if it doesn't work, I'm not going to be here anyway. That, that, I mean, that's, that's reminiscent or, or causes me to hearken to what uh, Buffalo Bills general manager Brandon Bean said into the Josh Allen move where they moved way up to get the kid from Wyoming. <laughs> where I mean, he was straight straight up paraphrasing. He was kind of like, I mean, yeah, it's something that had to be done. We needed we needed the spot. We love the guy. Uh, we're willing to work with him because of this accuracy, accuracy thing. But guess what? If it doesn't work, I ain't going to be here anyway. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be part of it. But it also, there is a certain price to pay when, when A, everybody knows you want something. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, that's like when, when Cousins left, okay, Darnold comes in on the one and 10, and you have Mullins and you have Hall, but everybody in the world knows you're interested in a quarterback. Um, so, so do the teams with whom you'll be dealing. All right. So there may be a quasi premium to pay with that. But if, if, if your belief, and, and, and really, even more importantly, the belief of those around you, if the common thread belief is this is what it takes to move here to get A, to move here to get B, A being I'm going to make A May and B McCarthy, um, and that's my preference, if, if, if the, the price that, that, uh, that's going to be needed is at this stage probably widely known league-wide. So, therefore, Quasey made a move a couple of Fridays ago to get an extra first-round pick because that potentially will satisfy the need of the person receiving so you can get into a spot that you covet. But other teams know that, too. So it's an interesting question, but I don't, you know, I've just never known anybody to be like, bleep it, I don't care what I'm, outside of the anti-vike, outside of what I'm giving up to get whatever I want. Because I may not be here. I don't think it's like that. Do you think that, is there a greater perceived safety net in any of this where if the team still has Kirk, and then is is there less desperation in them moving up than the current situation with Sam Darnold? Uh, whether it's guaranteed cash and all that, I, I think Kirk Cousins is a better quarterback than Sam Darnold. But mm-hmm. in the end, is there more desperation just because we have Kirk for another year or two? Oh, yeah. Are we having a different conversation oh. in regard to staying at 11? Yeah. If, if, if Cousins is on the team, the move for Houston's 23 may not take place. And the 11 goes backwards. The 11 goes to 16 and 16 goes to 21 and whatever. Oh, yeah. To amass picks to fortify the village. Now, they still have to fortify the village, but if we... It, it, the, cr- the crumbs are right there in front of all of us. It doesn't mean the all the takes are going to be right, including mine. But the amount of position filling that has been done during free agency 
That's fortifying the village. So now... Which isn't done if Kirk is still here, from a financial perspective. Correct. Uh, at least to, at least to, to the that extent. extent. That it, yeah. So, I mean, there, there are so many prove-it deals. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm certainly not saying they're throwing darts, but I mean, you know, there are new players here, left and right, seemingly, you know, every day or every other day, even though it's slowed down over the weekend. So, to answer the question, if Cousins is the quarterback, I think they fine-tune more in free agency. Uh, they find their way with 11 to trade to a spot to probably get Knicks or Penix, maybe, or maybe a three te- technique. I got no idea. But, you know, it, it's it, if Cousins is high end and, and playing extremely well for the next two or three years, I'm not going to be super surprised. And if that is or, or was not the case with the Vikings, they're still going to need a quarterback moving forward. Uh, last thing for you here, I did want to hit at least on the the idea of just, you know, let's throw some predictions out there. So I was reading this piece via ESPN.com with Dan Graziano, ESPN, Jordan Reed, Kevin Seifert, and the, the, the predictions are in for how they think things are going to happen in terms of the draft. And here's Jordan Reed. I'm watching for the Vikings to present them with a deal and an offer that they absolutely can't refuse and he has them giving he has them giving uh, 11-23 and a 2025 first rounder and an added day three pick to take May or Daniels. Mm. Seifert has them moving up just to four to take whoever's left. So as we move forward, there's still that split. It's May or it's McCarthy. Mm -hmm. It's three. It's four. Yeah. But that that first round pick next year, it's a sticking point via the text line. It's still very much, uh, much a thought on the minds of many. Um, okay, well, I mean, it, it's it's you, you, if you get the four spot, the fan has learned you're going to get one of the two. So now it comes down to the the those establishing and formulating the opinions as to which one's going to be better and why. Well, they they have to be right. But it, it's always a difficult it's always a difficult conversation because I mean like if May goes here if May goes to New England and McCarthy comes here okay now neither of them may play out of the gate but if they do who do we think has a better uh, uh, is better set up to succeed early JJ McCarthy with the Vikings offense or Drake May with the Patriots offense I think that answer would be JJ McCarthy <laughs> well that's not an affront on Drake May. Because it's going to take time for them to fortify, to a certain extent, what already is taking place here offensively. So it's, um, you know, it comes down to who, who, not who gets final say, but like who is in this metaphorical kitchen preparing this meal and who is responsible for the most significant parts of the meal? And, And is their opinion good? Are their instincts good? Uh, is their track record good in certain situations? And um, and uh, those are all things that are being bandied about now. Uh, let's pause and um, and uh, do you, uh, what you want me to do here? I think we can get Mark now, okay. and then we're going to keep this segment good. rolling. Let's do it. And uh, so I'm going to make that happen within the next 60 seconds. Thanks again to uh, thanks again to Thousand Hills Lifetime Grazed. Uh, thousandhillslifetimegraze.com for bringing you Vikes Bites and a weekly guest. And uh, we are waiting just due to uh, breaking and times and trying to fit everything in, then, in that we can as part of a vi- busy schedule that uh, the owner, Mark Wilf, will be joining us. Uh, here we go. He's calling uh, momentarily. And um, and after Mark Wilf, news du Nord. Uh, get back into that Wolves game. Uh, then uh, Bob Motzko, coach of the Golden Gophers hockey team. Sky, Sky Yuma, Mr. Motzko, Sky Yuma, they debut Thursday at 7.30 in Sioux Falls against Nebraska Omaha. Step number one of the uh, college hockey NCAA tournament with the Frozen Four about a month from now at XL Energy Center. Uh, Bob Motzko will join at about 10.47, a little less than an hour from now. Then uh, Lavelle Neal III, columnist for the Star Tribune. Uh, he will stop by the 651 Carpets Plus Studios uh, to discuss the Wolves' lot in life, 
uh, the Minnesota Wild and that uh, frustrating loss to St. Louis at XL Energy Center with the Saturday matinee. And um, also, what's going on with the Minnesota Twins? Because uh, Lavelle has uh, written several columns and um, also uh, been uh, to Fort Myers uh, talking with Rocco and uh, Derek Falvey and so on about uh, the state of the Minnesota Twins. And uh, the regular season uh, begins for most uh, very soon. So uh, Lavelle Neal III, the columnist from the Star Tribune at about 11 o'clock. Chris Finch, coach of the uh, T-Wolves, started 9 to noon about an hour ago. If you missed that interview, uh, we will play it back during the uh, final segment. But uh, now let's head down Orlando, Florida way. And uh, here is Mark Wilf, president and co-owner of the Minnesota Vikings. Hey, boss, it's Paul Allen. How is Orlando? Oh, it's great. How you doing? Pretty good, man. Got about five to ten inches of snow up here. You got palm trees and Andy Reid down there. I mean, that sounds good enough to eat, right? Yep, and we got Quasi and Coach O'Connell, too. So we got, we're all set on our end. Um, and I said I referenced Andy Reid because I'm, I just got done looking at that annual coaches picture where certain coaches never show up for it. But Andy Reid's always in the middle with that big pronounced uh, Hawaiian Tommy Bahama shirt. So he just he, he sticks out with that shirt. You know what I mean? I got you. L- looks good. Looks good. Uh, what, uh, uh, Mark, what, what do you enjoy about these days together with owners, coaches, GMs, and so on uh, when you get together at the owners' meetings? Well, it's always a good reset, kind of restarting our whole uh, collective NFL engine. We get uh, recharge our batteries, so to speak, also kind of set the strategy, visit where we've been, where we're going, take a look at the rules, make the game better, take a look at making the fan experience stronger, all the all the things we talk about. But it's always good to get together with uh, fellow uh, executives, uh, coaches, GMs, and uh, work to make the game better and, uh, and, and take stock of where we are. Hey, Mark, um, I think this is pretty cool, man. 20th year of team ownership for your family this next football season. Uh, it, it, it's been a heck of a run for you guys, boss. Man, uh, many memories to cherish, right? A lot of memories to cherish, a lot of great uh, uh, improvements and and, uh, enhancements to get us where we want to be, which is, of course, first-class, world-class organization, but uh, making our fan experience number one, uh, making our community stronger and better. But uh, the one goal we're still working on every single minute is uh, bringing that Super Bowl trophy uh, to our fans, and uh, we're always hard at work at that, and that's that's the goal we're still working on. And and over the last couple of weeks of free agency, Mark, I mean, it's like name tags are required to the facility these days with all the new players. What um what do you like about the first couple of weeks of free agency for your Vikings? Well, we're, we're we're super super excited. We've had a real. I think Quasi and Kevin have developed a real comprehensive approach. Of course, uh, change at the quarterback position. Super excited on the defensive side of the ball. Um, a lot of great young impact players. I think the fans, Jonathan Grenard, uh, Van Ginkel, Cashman, just adding to our depth, young impact players. And I know Coach Flores is working hard uh, to get our defense where we want it to be. And uh, we made some real great strides here in the early days of free agency. And I know the draft coming up in a few weeks, and we're going to keep going on our plan. And I think uh, really pleased with the progress so far. And and defensively, Mark, uh, from from the new to the common thread. I mean, Harrison Smith is going to be back for his 13th season, and and he, he he's just been a bastion of excellence for you guys, hasn't he? Well, Harrison, I mean, our fans know it. You know it. Just a special person, immeasurable impact on our organization these past 12 years. I mean, the ultimate team player, uh, just tremendous. 13th season, incredible. How he takes care of himself, how he leads, how he plays on and off the field. So uh, kudos to Harrison, and we're just excited for him being back on the field and have him and his family part of the Vikings organization for another season. Hey, boss, how about that um, How about that trade a couple of Fridays ago? You now have the 11 and 23 in the first round, and, and I mean, you've seen enough of it, been part of enough of it. You you can do some serious damage with those picks. Does uh, does all of that excite you? Very much so. I mean, uh, this is where I know Quasi and Kevin wanted to be, and we wanted to be just the flexibility we now have in the draft, whether that means moving up, down, staying where we are, whatever it is. 
uh, between between the moves we made, where we are with our salary cap, where we are with our draft picks, I think we're poised well to uh, to, to do something that can really be a long term impact. Our goal: sustainable success. That's what we want to have. I think this goes a long way towards achieving that. Well, last uh, last Monday when uh, the radio show was at your facility, uh, Quasi Adolfo Mensa, nice enough to start the show with us, and and I asked him uh, a pointed question, and he said, "Yes, there is a preferred scenario we have in the first round." All right, so assumedly the team president and uh, and co owner, well, you, you become privy to the preferred scenario in the first round, right, Mark? I am privy, and we have a plan, and uh, that's what I can say. That's awesome. And, uh, and I think that's what the fans would expect us to say because, you know, we have yeah. to be prepared for all contingencies. Things play out all different ways. The bottom line is our ownership. We have complete faith in Quasi, Kevin, our personnel, coaching staffs, the communication, the way they're working together. I, I know uh, I, I'm telling our fans right now uh, we're, in good, we're in good hands, and uh, – we're, we're, we're going to really uh, we're going to really work well together here going through the draft. Uh, Mark, Mark Wilf, team president, co-owner of the Minnesota Vikings from Orlando and the annual owners meetings. Now, um, uh, with, with some of these proposed rule changes, Mark, what uh, what do you think of the kickoff return proposal? I mean, landing zone guys covering from the opponents, 30 and so on. What uh, what uh, 40 that is. What uh, what do you think well, of all that? I, I think there's been a lot of work by all the special teams coaches around the league. I, I know that's still a continuing conversation going on among us. Um, we happen to be in favor of, of doing something differently. Um, I think the XFL uh, uh, way they, they did it in that one year is kind of the base of how the special teams coaches have come out on it. So it's still being uh, discussed, talked through. The bottom line is uh, it's a play part of the history of the NFL for so many decades and I think uh, it's it's owed to be a, a meaningful play. I think the statistics came that uh, it, it really dropped from being a meaningful play, and I think they want to get it to be a, a meaningful play, but at the same time with safe and health, safety and health in mind. So that's the way we're looking at it. I know uh, we're in favor of making a change here, and con- conversations continue. Do, do, do what, what chance do you think there is now or maybe moving forward, Mark? That um, that there there would be no kickoff and teams would just start at the twenty five. Uh, I don't think that's uh, that's in the cards. Certainly at this meeting, and that has not really come up in any conversations at this point. So good. Uh, uh, so I, I would uh, I would say no. It is uh, two more. Is there a concern within league circles that scoring is a tad down? Uh, it was a little bit down. And I, I know, again, uh, I, I think they're going to be in a wait-and-see mode to see how that evolves here in the next year. So it might have been just a blip. And, of course, we want it to be exciting for the fans. The games have been as competitive as they've ever been. Uh, games coming down to the fourth quarter, the last five minutes, all the rest. So I think that competitiveness, the highest among all the major sports uh, in North America, and uh, makes the game so exciting, and that's why our fans love it. That's why we love it, and that's why we're going to put our seatbelts on every every September when the game starts. Last one, and thanks for the time. Uh, congratulations to you guys on the NFLPA ranking uh, with the team top two for amenities. Uh, this is becoming a common thread. Amenities, ownership, coaching, travel, and et cetera. Uh, always good to know the players are comfortable, right? Yeah, I think I, I think it is about the players, and, and also importantly, our fa- uh, the families of the players and our and, and our staff. Uh, you know, we, we we love our facilities; they're, they're number one in so many so many areas. Our stadiums, our fans know it. Uh, all the rest, our training facility, those that come out to training camp, which is before you know it. So uh, we have amazing buildings, but the b- bottom line is our people are first class, and that's what we want. We want a world class organization. And that starts the people we have. It's set by the, the culture that Kevin and Quasey and our CEO, Andrew Miller, all the entire executive team making sure uh, that everyone in the building feels welcome and, and cared for in the same way for our fans. And that's how we approach it. And that's we're very proud of the uh, the ranking. Thanks for the time, my friend. Safe travels. And I'm sure I'll see you uh, sometime relatively soon. All right, PA, thank you. Good to talk to you. Yep, you too. See you about Mark Wilf, president and uh, co-owner of the Minnesota Vikings, from the owners' meetings in Orlando. We'll be right back.